Hi, I'm Jo Taylor and welcome to the Misadventures podcast. This week we've got Rialina joining us, uh, telling us a few of her stories. Serious stories. Yeah, serious, serious stories. With a sprinkling of comedy, as always. Always. Always here on the Misadventures podcast. Um, so uh, just before we get into that, Stamps, how you been? All right. Now there are only. Hang on. You only ask me how I've been because you want me to say, Joe, how have you been? <laughs> no. You do. It's a loaded question. No, it's not. It's not. You don't I don't give know. a shit how I've been. You have just obviously got something you want to say. No, that was that was genuine then. But I just then I've realised I only saw you. When did I see you? Yesterday, Tuesday. Yeah, I only saw you Tuesday. There's no way anything's changed in your life in the last two days, okay, is there? Okay, now, well, what's changed in your life in the last two days? <laughs> oh, God. Uh, absolutely nothing. nothing. There you go. <laughs> oh, actually, no, I've had a problem with my car. Oh. So, not necessarily interesting, but something that you didn't know. Um, so, yes, I had a recovery guy come up today, check the car over, tell me what I already knew. But what he did do... Sounds like the start of a porn film. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what he did do was check my engine. Oh my god! And rev me up while I played with his gear stick. I was driving, actually. <laughs> I bet you were driving him wild. Good god! Anyhow, so um, people may have seen on our Instagram account, I did do a little bit of my own travelling this weekend. Not too far, but I did drive up to Newcastle this weekend. See. Now we get to the crux of why you asked me how I've been, just so you can talk about your trip to Newcastle. No, because you know what? If I wanted to talk about myself, I'd just talk about myself. I don't care. No. So, All yeah. Right, fair enough. Uh, but yeah, I went up to Newcastle this weekend. I've never been to Newcastle before. It was a new one for me. Uh, the girls had never been to Newcastle before either, so they were pretty excited about it. So why did you pick Newcastle? Because you'd never been before? Yes. Maybe fair that enough. wasn't clear. <laughs> And also, obviously, it's meant to be quite lively, good nightlife, all that, all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, we just went, went there for a couple of days. It was very, very good. Um, oh gosh, so many students. So I tell you what, if um, have you been to, have you been for a night out in Newcastle stamps? Not for a long time. I went to Newcastle right. for my brother-in-law's stag do. That was this is thing. It was a long time ago, right? All right. I mean, yeah, relatively. Like, yeah. 10 so, years oh my god so a good, a good while before i was actually legally allowed out to drink so oh, right. a good while but yeah it's you know it's really weird because there are so many students there and i tell you what students don't dress how i used to dress when i was going out girls just wear jeans trainers t-shirt like well actually quite a nice top but jeans and trainers so yeah so it's, so students they dress in a very very um casual manner yeah yeah very cash so me and the girls um were going to certain places that were full of students and definitely didn't fit in there i saw your pictures you was dolling yourselves right up exactly we were glam for the weekend furry furry boots furry boots that wasn't me there was definitely some fur going on somewhere are you even looking at the right account <laughs> I think I was wearing a fur coat. There was a night where you were like all going out, dressed up for the warm or something. Yeah, I was dressed up warm. I didn't have a coat on. You had some at furry with you. It was a bag. <laughs> How are you ruining this? All I want to do is tell the people I went to Newcastle for a weekend. The students were dressed very differently to how I used to dress. Well, I was never a student, but how students used to dress when I was of student age. Yeah. And then we went into some bars and it was basically people that were like 35 to like 45. Nothing wrong with that. No, nothing wrong with it. But it's like they're the kind of like they were like this little bit older era and they were a bit... Mm, me and the girls couldn't really go in a bar without just couldn't just go and enjoy ourselves without being chatted up. Yeah, which we're not really a fan of, to be honest. We just we don't we're not. We just want to you know have have just go out, have girl time, that kind of thing. Um, dance to some cheesy music. Uh, but yeah, but but I tell you what, going into the student places, we were not bothered at all because we were the three old crones in the corner. So yeah, it was, and then we went. Out in the daytime in the Saturday, went to Point Blank. Have you ever heard of that? Nope. 
so it's like one of these new like crazy places like these one of these fun places and essentially it's like you just it's like a computer game with oh sounds like an erectile dysfunction clinic I suppose but it definitely wasn't but um no yeah it was uh it was quite fun so it got it got it got kind of competitive um uh, yeah it was quite fun little weekend with the girls i don't think any dramas i think we were all good no dramas all fine um, oh, we did. We actually, that's not true. We went out for dinner and I'm saying literally seconds after we like moved out of our seat, a massive fight broke out in the restaurant, huge between three groups. And this guy that I could only describe as something like Big Bird, he was massive. <laughs> Big Bird? Yeah. Was he yellow with a beak? No, but he did wear, he was wearing a kind of goose coat. He okay. was strangling a woman. What? There was women strangling women. This big bird bloke was strangling another woman. He was wrestling people to the ground. There was dr- drinks being thrown. It was about 15 people going wild. And me and the girls were literally sat on the table behind. And they were like sprawling all around the floor right next to where I was sat. And I was like, oh, my God, imagine if we were still sat there crazy that's what i imagine when i see like geordie shaw that's what i imagine newcastle's like that was literally the one and only time we saw any trouble oh right sounds crazy yeah everyone's very lovely there so that was that was my that was my um my weekend um but ria has got some really crazy stories um so yes let's take a listen i'm not gonna have time to listen to them after your waffle on with the episode this is quite relevant so stamps got himself a new car an electric car and yeah congratulations the planet thanks you we took the first trip in the new electric motor up to manchester actually to come and see yourself adam rowe and dan nightingale and esther minito at the, oh, you know, the, the home ground thing, thing? Yes, like that was at yeah, in the car park yeah we were there oh congratulations that was yeah. an interesting gig it was weird, right? Yes, thank you. That was the word. It must have been so tough on that massive stage. And then everyone's so spread out and so far away. And, the, you know, like the, all of the audience were so far away from you. It must have been so tricky to interact with us. Yes, it was more like a stadium gig or a theater gig than it yeah. was a club gig. It was somewhere in between. I think the biggest pro- the biggest thing that made it difficult for me was just that we were coming out of lockdown, so it was just a bit rusty. Mm-hmm. So I apologize. No, we had a good time. Okay, good. That's the right answer. We thought it was great. But um, yeah, so we, w- we, so we went on to Manchester in uh, Stamps' new electric car. And when I got in the car, me being a, a car person... Um, I was like, oh, is it what you expected? And Stamps basically turned around to me and said, oh, I didn't have any expectations. I didn't know what I was really getting. He hadn't been and looked at the car or anything. He literally like just picked it from a website and was like, yep, yeah, that one will do. It's a car. And I just could never imagine picking a car that yeah, way. Yeah, but I, th- I think you can with an electric yeah. car. With an electric car, you pretty much can. Like, do you go and look at a at a blender before you buy it on Amazon? No, you don't go like, show me the blender and show me the curved alloys. Okay, maybe I'll buy it. <laughs> I would. I would go and look at John Lewis. I'd go into John Lewis and have a look. Ooh, someone's doing well. <laughs> <laughs> no one's saying I'm buying from John Lewis. Right, I'm just, just saying, having so a look going, and then jumping yeah, on Amazon. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because let's face it, all the people in John Lewis are going to be super helpful. Like, way more than lots of other shops. They so are going to up sound the shit out of that blender. Yeah, yeah. I, I can ask so many questions. Well, this is true. This is true. And anything to distract you from price comparing it on the internet, that is their main job right now. Is, no, no, yeah, don't, don't, look do it that. Up. don't look it up. I'll answer all your questions. Don't, don't even mm. go on the internet. No, no, no. We haven't, uh, you know, priced this five quid higher than everyone else. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. So no. So I, I am in to my cars somewhat, and stamps is not. So, um, well, wait. Just to finish the electric. Where do you charge it at the other end to get to go home again? Wow. So wow. that was yeah. So I had to find the the car park behind the car park where the gig was that actually mm. had charging points in it. No, that's incredible. Yeah. So you were just mm. able to charge at the gig. Yeah, we left it charging all day while we went for something to eat and then came to the gig 
It didn't That's have quite incredible. enough energy to get us home, so we had to start yeah. off and charge it on the motorway. It didn't have quite enough energy That's to get us there. <laughs> we had we had twelve, we had nine miles to go and twelve miles on the battery. Oh, so when we got literally to Manchester City Centre, like all of a sudden, Stamps just turns off all the AC. It was a baking <laughs> hot day, as I'm sure you remember. Mm. We had no air conditioning. The music went off. Everything, like all 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 non essential electrics, went it's off. It's bizarre because everything is wired to the battery. So it's like right, unplug the phones, turn off the radio. So it's a hundred percent electric. It's not even 100%. got. It's not dual. No. Oh yeah. Wow, no. that's brave. Do you know what? I I know it's the future, but they better like they don't have enough charging points right now for you no, to. Definitely no, not. I agree. We do still have a planet killing car as well. It is just our second car. So we're not we're not solely reliant on the electric car. Yeah, but we just wanted you wanted to test it out, didn't you? Yeah. Stamps. See, I wanted to brave it. Do you know what? I did a very similar journey in let's say two thousand and three. I don't know, something like that. Two thousand and three maybe? In a leaded petrol car to from Ooh. London to Liverpool. And There's it was not just, many places okay. left to get leaded petrol. Oh, well, there isn't any more now. But this was no. back when it was, you know, just at the tail end. And we got given, we got sold the car for a pound. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I have a gig in Liverpool. Can we do it? And, they, and so we tried to drive all the way there, but then got into that kind of like panicked, like, oh, crap. Where are we going to get petrol to get all the way home again? So it was quite, yeah. quite a, a tight one there. So can you just help me out here? I only ever, I've only ever known as unleaded i don't know leaded what are you want about leaded leaded well what, unleaded what? was called unleaded to distinguish it from leaded petrol otherwise it would have just so been called the, petrol apart from it being leaded what's the difference that's it that is the difference it has lead in it it was full of lead it was full of lead <laughs> and is that bad burn it when you combust it yeah it was horrendous for the oh, environment right, okay you were just it was called four oh. star yes four star petrol yeah <laughs> and when did this stop when did that go out of fashion mm. i reckon my first, yeah. shortly after, yeah. Go on, you guess, and I'll Google. <laughs> so my my <laughs> first my first car. Oh, we're going back. Petrol, Bloody hell. And it was just on the cusp. So I reckon. When did I learn to drive? I reckon it was around two thousand ninety nine to two thousand. What? You learned to drive yeah. in nineteen ninety nine. Yeah. Oh, my, oh wow! Okay. That's right, isn't it? I was 17. Yeah, 1999. I reckon it was around then. 2000. No wonder I've got no concept of this. <laughs> it says that leaded petrol was eventually banned under EU rules at the start of 2000. Yes. But I know that we could still buy it. Yeah, so well done on that one. But I know that we, it was a leaded petrol car, so they must have still had it at the Yeah, pumps. I think they just weren't allowed to like build new ones, like with the diesel car thing. They just yes, had to stop yeah. at that point. Because, I, yeah, I really struggled. Okay. Yes. And I remember actually just recently seeing that the last, that now leaded petrol has gone on the entire planet because they've just finished it in somewhere like Libya. Or just Syria. drained the last they resources. finally used up. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's now no longer. Oh, well, that's good then, isn't right. it? Well, yeah. I mean, we could have brought in electric cars a lot sooner than we have. Mm. Recycled oil. Like, you know, we're not moving as quickly away from fossil fuels as we could. And then... When companies like, um, when big cigarette companies, uh, there was a big cigarette company whose name, I, if you said it, I would go, yes, that's the one, but I can't think of it off the top of my head, said we want to move into, a, like, they wanted to move from cigarette manufacturing into health product manufacturing. Philip Morris. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's Philip Morris. And they said they want to change direction. Everyone's gone, who the hell are you to change direction? How dare you change direction? Oh, yeah, Philip Morris is buying an asthma inhaler company. And everyone's gone, who the hell are you to buy an asthma inhaler company? And you're going, hang on a second. Can we get some perspective? They're trying to move away from cigarettes because they can see it being the end. And they're trying to move into They're trying to uh -huh. save the company. And it, although it's ironic that they're going to move from killing lungs to, to saving, saving lungs, we still need to go, yay, well done. What on Keep earth? going. I know, but... Otherwise, what? All those people just lose their jobs and you go, sorry, you backed the wrong horse. <laughs> Should have backed the asthma. <laughs> Never back an asthmatic in a race. 
<laughs> unless it's against a smoker right you know what a, so, what a turn this is taken no, we're, edu- we're educating people today indeed oh, i think i'm always educated on this podcast you know we're good so <laughs> uh but we are here to talk about your traveling mm. adventures um ria so we've got a few little headlines and well they are something different Okay. In that, are you telling me that no one else has given you these headlines before? Um, well, no. one, the poisoning we've heard. Well, it depends. It de- was it, You must have it, done Well, that. it depends. Is it food poisoning or a different type? Because that is a different kind, definitely not. Oh, that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah. But no, I don't think that I, I don't think that anyone tried to poison me oh, in okay, any other okay. way. All right, then. Yeah, that would be different. It was an you ironic, it was an ironic <laughs> poisoning, food poisoning. Okay. But it was it was still of the food. Okay, so um, you're in the Philippines. Uh-huh. So I'm Fil- well, I'm I'm Fil- I'm half Filipina. Mm-hmm. So my mother's Filipina. Um, I look Filipina, all of that. But never been to Asia until I was an adult because my mother doesn't have any cultural connection. So she has the look and the appetite, but not the actual. Um, like she was, she was moved out of there when she was a kid by an American, was raised as an American, doesn't speak the language. She can fry up spam like nobody's business, but, <laughs> every, but like, you don't have to have been to the Philippines to know how to fry good spam. Yeah. And um, so I'd never been, and I didn't go until I was um, an adult. I was on a comedy tour. And when I got there, and the Filipinos are so welcoming, like those that know you, if they don't, they'll try and cheat you out of anything. It was a really kind of weird juxtaposition. You go out to the, to the countryside and it's just beautiful, beautiful people. And they're just wonderful and generous. But at the same time, it's a third world country. Mm-hmm. So there's always tra- someone trying to scam you. My mm-hmm. sister was with me on the tour, for example. And we were in a hotel in Manila and I was like, I want to get a massage. So I ordered a massage, you know, through the hotel and the woman comes up and she has a little timer and she, she just does it on the bed and the towels and whatever. And so she does the, um, you know, it came for three, whatever, three o'clock. I ordered an hour. She does the, the massage or whatever. And then she goes and my sister goes, oh, actually that looked quite good. I think I'll get one. So she calls down and orders a massage. So they go, oh yeah, no problem. And the same girl comes back up again. At which point we realize it's only 3.45. So she's <laughs> cheated me out of 15. at least 15 yeah. minutes of my massage because she never thought that she'd have to come back to the same room. And then my sister, having, having figured that out, was just like, you're going to give me an hour though, right? And she's like, yes. So I'm going, hang on a second. <laughs> I only got 45 minutes. You, I'm having my 15 minutes first. And then- where's my, yeah, where's my... Where's my, I tipped you, woman. I tipped you because I felt <laughs> sorry for you. So there's that side of it. But anyway, all of the comics in the comedy world in Manila were just, were so welcoming and just like, oh my God, I can't believe you've never been here before. And so they would often separate me from the other comics on the tour that weren't Filipino and go, well, you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to learn your culture. And I was like, great. So they took me to a food market, you know, in the, so everyone goes to some restaurant that's probably the equivalent of Arby's or whatever, you know, yeah. for burgers. Yeah. And he, and this guy's like, no, no, no. You must come and have uh, the dish. I don't remember the name um, at this food stall or whatever. And so we go and I go, I don't know what I'm eating. You order, we'll eat. We order the same thing. We eat the same thing yeah. and it's fine. And then the next day or the day after I fly to Singapore. Okay. And in Singapore, after another, after 48 hours since I've been in the Philippines, I really like, I feel like I have butterflies in my stomach. Yeah. I'm like, oh. Or a bit of gas or just something. Do you know what I mean? You know when some, you feel like something's moving independently <laughs> of your body, but inside your something's body? Something's starting yeah. to happen. Yeah, we just would go, oh, this is a bit, and it was feeling a bit weird. And then, you know, and then it was kind of like that trickle you get when you know that you've got a bit of the rub going on and you're going, oh, okay, things are happening. And I was flying back to, I was flying back to London the day after that. Yeah. And by the time the day of the flight came, I was full blown not well in that kind of, you know, like fever, shivers, sweating, you know, cramps, Oh no! just all, just all of that. And all I was there going, I I have to, my sister flew separate. She flew back. She lives in New York. So she flew back to New York. I fly by myself, long haul. But all I could think was, I can't let them know that I'm ill. I can't let them know. Like they were not, I was ill enough that if they, if they, figured it out they'd be like don't let this woman on the plane right, yeah. she will infect us all oh, you know like that that could have been the start of the pandemic but <laughs> what you know 
So I had to, so I was just there in like, I had a hoodie on, I wrapped myself up. So I was like, why is she sweating? Oh, she's wrapped up in too many clothes, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm an idiot tourist that doesn't know how to dress in a, in a tropical country. Yeah. Um, and I just had to kind of sneak onto the plane and then luckily had a couple seats to myself. So oh, just good. sort of lay down there. Yeah. Luckily was able to kind of be like, I, I changed my seat to the back of the plane. So I wasn't too far from the toilets. And then, so I managed to get to the flight, managed to get all the way home and it wasn't done. It was done. It was like a few more days after that, oh, just like gosh. it ravaged my system. Um, and I'll be honest with you. I came out of that week looking fabulous. <laughs> oh my God. I've, I was, I just, I stood up on day seven and just went, this is the diet for me. Um, this was, I mean, totally worth it. But I called the guy, you know, at the end, I got in touch with him once I was better and said, Hey, are you okay? Cause I just had awful food poisoning. And he went, Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I should have realized the, yeah, our food markets have all sorts of bugs in them, but we're used to it. Oh, <laughs> They've goodness. got iron so He was fine. Yeah. The, 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 he said, yeah, they have, there's a whole, like, like the kitchen clean, there is no health and safety. No, yeah. So they obviously, it's all sorts of bugs, but they're all used to it over there. So they're oh. like, oh yeah, we, we, we had them when we were two and we're fine now, you know? Yeah. So he, he apologized profusely and he went, oh, I should have, I should have realized because I was the only person who ate at the food market. So that's how I knew it must have been yeah. that food market. Yeah. I mean, was it at least good what you ate? Was it worth it? Um. Yeah, I think so. Oh, it was like no. a, it was, if it's not it a was solid a yes, stew. it means no. No, I mean, it was a meat stew. I, you know, it was meat and Meh. stewy. Yeah. It was, yeah, I mean, it was probably spicy. I don't do spice very well, okay. so it's probably a little bit spicier than I could handle. I love a meat stew, but it's not like, do I dream of that stew? Not in a, I can't wait to get back to it kind of yeah. way, you know, in a, God, I wish I could look that good again that easy kind of way, <laughs> maybe. But. <laughs> oh my goodness. So I I have never I've never been to like the Philippines or anything. So I don't know if is it like a particular area where there'll be like that, like a cert, like certain markets or all restaurants people aren't used to it can get poor. No, like, I, I really I, don't I, know. I think it was I think it's a cultural thing. Okay. Genuinely, I think it was a cultural Because he ate, we shared the food. He ate the same food. Yeah. And it wasn't like it was oysters or mussels where I could go, oh, I must have just eaten a dud one. Yeah. We were eating the same serving. Yeah. So, and and we had a chat about it. And he said, yeah, that often happens is that people that are new to the Philippines yeah. can get quite upset stomachs initially. But is it only from because, the markets? Um, I can't answer that. But I did, mm-hmm. I ate... I was on. I went on another trip another time, and I ate other food and didn't have a problem. Oh, okay. I don't think you can like go. I will just avoid the market, no. and I will be fine. I mean, one of the other things we were told to w- look out for was actually bottled water. Yeah. Like, only drink bottled water, mm. but also you have to check that the bottle that you've bought is a genuinely sealed bottle yeah, of water yeah. because they often recycle the bottles and just put tap water oh, in it God. and sell it to you because oh, it's so hot and there's stalls everywhere. So, again, it's like this thing of how they're wonderful and welcoming and lovely. And the guy's like, I must take you to the food markets. But then the mas- you know, the masseuse cheated me out of 15 <laughs> minutes because she thought she could get away with it. It's like these two different sides, but they're, but you have to remember that overall we're coming from such a place of privilege Mm. to this country anyway you know that in the philippines they're so overpopulated in manila i'm sorry they're so overpopulated and there's so many people and so many cars that you can only drive your car on certain days of the week according to your registration plate so like l plates can only yeah it starts with an l you can drive on a tuesday and if it starts with an m you can drive on a wednesday i did not know that because they have such bad traffic and stuff that's Mm. insane so overall, I want to say the message is, if you travel to these places, try and support the local, you know, try and support the local economy. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of why you're there. But also be aware that you might not have the stomach of steel that <laughs> you think you do. Yeah. Coming from the softy, softy, health and safety protected <laughs> way. Uh, that's what I was going to say, because you mentioned the water. It's like a really extreme case of don't drink the local water, isn't it? Like we do when we get when we go anywhere as... Namby family English are told, don't drink the local water because it might give you a dodgy tummy. That's like the most extreme yeah, and version. Yeah, check your hotel. Yeah. yeah. And even, and you got to check, like the higher, you know, the more expensive the hotel, the four or five stars hotel, they're going to be much more clear about it. But everybody gives you, everybody that you kind of, you know, the hotel will give you bottled water mm. and tell you don't drink the bathroom water, that kind of stuff. Yeah. 
Whereas, of course, in Europe, anywhere, you can make a cup of tea from the bathroom sink. Yeah, yeah. That flight must have been oh, fun, though. On, I mean, honestly, I, luckily, I slept through most of it. Uh, and because I stopped, because it started the day before while I still had a hotel room, and I had to gig with it as well. So I was in the hotel room all day. Oh, no. Just sort of, you know, emptying the system, went out, did my last gig, <laughs> went back to the hotel. <laughs> So there wasn't a lot in the system at that point to kind of, it was just. You must have been exhausted. It was just, it was just wearying because I wasn't eating, you know, you're not eating. Yeah. And, yeah. and actually that's why when I stood up, I went, wow, I didn't think I'd ever lose that pocket of that donut of fat around my belly button, you know, <laughs> and it was gone, but my body put it back on very quickly. It just went, Ooh, yeah, there's, give, yeah. there's, give me something. There's some storage space here. <laughs> Let's fill it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so when you were in the philippines apart from going out for food did you get a chance to do anything else were you there because obviously you you were you know going to see um, like where i walked some, around somewhere a bit. you'd never been before yeah but. i walked around a bit in manila i had the gig so we were busy on the tour with that um on another trip we went out to another island and just got a couple of days like on the island, on the beach, and people could kind of walk around and everything. But it was more like, it was a bit of a holiday. So I just got a, a bit of a feel for a couple parts of, of the country. But I haven't been able yeah. to go and just have a proper holiday, which would be nice one day. It would be nice to go. Yeah. But it's weird for me. It's very weird for me with an Asian Western face to travel to Asia. Because over here, I identify very strongly as Asian, as part of the Asian diaspora. But when I go over there, it's very clear that I am not, you know, I'm Western. Yeah. So it's a, it's a oh, bit weird. Really? So you kind of go, you kind of go. Oh, I'm I'm out of place here in the UK because yeah. I don't look, you know, like I come from here. Even though I was born here, and I'm British, and I've lived here most of my life. You know, I've always been made to feel a little bit other. Or you know, why should we put you on TV if we put someone from Yorkshire on TV? All of the North will bandy behind them. If we put you on TV, who's going to bandy behind you? You know, there's always been that kind of thing in my career. So to then go to Asia. And still feel foreign. Yeah, it's that a must real, be so bizarre. It's a real yeah. kind of oh, I don't, I don't belong anywhere. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you so much. And my stomach sucks. Apparently, <laughs> <laughs> does the humor translate? Is it kind of Western humor, or is it no? Well, okay, so in different parts of Asia, different humors, obviously, uh, and yeah. different mm -hmm. comedy circuits that are evolved to different levels. Singapore. And Hong Kong more evolved, but then they've got a lot of, you know, high business and English speaking um, people moving through there all the time. So there's, you know, it's a, there's a lot of uh, clientele to kind of help build that scene. Um, and there's comedy everywhere, China, Bangkok, all, all of these um, cities and countries have English language comedy in them and they're growing all the time. When I was in the Philippines, right. and this was a while ago five, six, seven years ago, um, the Philippines was just starting. So there were a couple of comedians there. It was a very small scene. They all knew each other. But what I found is that playing to Filipinos, unlike other Asian um, uh, citizens, it, other Asian, Asian citizens, yeah, is that right? Countries? Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> nationalities, that's the word I'm looking for, as opposed <laughs> to playing to other nationalities, is the Filipinos are very trusting. They're very open. They're very giving. They're very joyful overall. They're wonderful, like very uplifting. But it means that when you're there, if you do anything sarcastic or you start telling us, you know, if you're doing that kind of very British down on yourself comedy or yeah. you're, you're making kind of jokes at people's expenses, they get too invested in that. And instead of laughing and seeing the joke, they go, hola, oh, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah. it's sort of like, you know, so. I was there going, you know, you know, when unicorns do this and they go, unicorns exist. Woo -hoo! You're going, no, no, sorry. Wait. <laughs> I didn't mean that. So I found that that was tricky, especially for my style of comedy. Yes. Yeah. It's like everything you say, they take it at face yes. value. Yes. Yeah. So Filipinos over here, I get a lot of them coming to see me and they're like, oh, it's so great to see a Filipino on stage. And I'm like, yay. But we, we bond as a diaspora. I think. And I think that's important. Whereas when I go to the Philippines, that's the beauty about Filipinos. They're so supportive. They're so lovely. They will love you no matter where you are in the world. If you're one of them, you're one of them. And they do make you feel very much a part of the club. But, uh, but I found that playing to them in Manila was really tricky because there wasn't, you know, 
they have a diff- they find different things funny. But maybe yeah. that's changed now. Um, that you know, five six years on, they'll have more access to comedy because it is you know they do speak yeah. English as a as a first language or as a as a fluent language. But I think they school in English. Yeah. Do you think you'll go back? Like, because obviously you said that your mom your mom hasn't hasn't been back, has she? I don't think she's been back since seventies, maybe maybe yeah. the eighties. Do you think like because you said you want to go back? Do you think you'd go back as like a family holiday? Uh, if I did, it would be with me and my kids. Maybe my mom. I don't know. I don't know. If she wants to. Oh, okay. You know, she she knows which side her bread is buttered. <laughs> <laughs> the western side. So yeah. <laughs> Um, she'll, she's, she's married to a German. She'll eat potatoes as often as she'll eat rice, <laughs> if not more. She's, yeah. My goodness. So like your heritage is from the Philippines and you mm-hmm. were born in, in the UK, but did you grow up in the US? No, my father's German. My mother's right. Filipino American. I was born yeah. in the UK. And then my childhood was briefly in California, then back to England, then to the Netherlands, then back to Scotland. Well, wow. back to the UK and then back to England for university. And then I stayed here ever since. God, I just think that's so interesting. Like I was, You have lived, Rhea. Yeah. I have. I've I was lived. born in Coventry and I still live here. <laughs> that's, <laughs> <it>. <laughs> that's incredible because I've seen Coventry. So I'm very. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Why would I you get, out get out as out? much as I can. Believe me. Out of Coventry um, or just. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. 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 Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Didn't it get um, bombed a lot in the war? It did, yes. It we did suffer. Yeah, it yeah. caused a load of improvements. Yeah. No, I think Ooh. I think if, the, if that hadn't that happened... That got nothing. It deserved more, but it got nothing. I'm that thinking, was harsh. I, I think, no, I, I genuinely think if Coventry wasn't um, touched during the war like it was, then I think it'd be like a really nice city now, a bit like kind of... Mm. Um, Kenilworth or Warwick or those kind of places because we did have a lot of really old buildings. Just don't try and avoid saying Leamington. <laughs> you would like skirting around everywhere except Leamington. So Slamps is from Leamington and he likes to remind me so. Leamington um, Spa? Yeah, yes. Oh. Yes. <laughs> look at him look at him just dialing that spa down. A yeah. Bit. Oh, Make it's you feel the first time. Oh, he always he always I like making other people yeah. throw. I make, like making other people say spa, yeah. so I don't have to. <laughs> no, yeah, so, <laughs> but um, but your stories from uh, is, I don't know if this is the same trip, but your stories don't stop there. When you were in Singapore, you also had a bit of an incident. I did different trip as well. Different trip. That was okay. Different time. So also to do with being Filipino. So I don't always remember that I look this way, you know, because (laughs) you don't, you don't, you don't normally think that, do you walking down the street? Remember you look Asian, remember you look Asian. And then other people sometimes will not so kindly remind you. But, um, I was in Singapore and I'm Western and generally the hierarchy is Western trumps other people but in that high you know because they'll have like their high right Westerner will trump a local and then within the locals you might have like a Singaporean uh Chinese Singaporean might trump a Filipino woman because they have you know they have hierarchies of society I know we have a class system so it's kind of similar but they do have these kind of unspoken ways of treating people rightly or wrongly and in Singapore of course one of the things that you know is illegal is homosexuality and that's illegal and i'd say that just because it's relevant kind of relevant to the irony of the story not that i have any kind of judgment on that other than it's a shame that they feel that way because yeah there, it shouldn't be is that still the case i think so is it, is it still illegal in chewing gum and homosexuality is that the same thing right. <laughs> yeah yeah. I mean, among other things, like I'm not saying like murder is legal, but homosexuality isn't. I'm just saying. But hubba bubba, you are not having any hubba bubba. No hubba bubba, but you know, or bubba hubba, you know. If it's <laughs> oh my goodness. Just to be clear. Um, certainly when I was there, now obviously they're not going to go and burst into people's doors. And if they're doing something privately, I don't think it's. Like, I assume they're not going, I, think, I don't think they have gay police that go around going, mm. you two guys, <laughs> just stand arrested for, yeah, people. You, you two stand further apart, please. <laughs> you put on a shirt over that gorgeous um, op. <laughs> but anyway, I'm on a tour with a number of comedians. And I go up to the reception 
desk to check into my hotel. And so there's two seats, there's two terminals at the reception. And I go and I sit and they have little seats in front of them. And they go, please sit down. And you sit down and the girl starts checking me in. And we're doing this and, and it's quite complicated. And they want your passport and you know all these details and da, da, da. We're going through it. And then someone else comes and sits in the other seat. And it's another one of the comics uh, who's called Tom Allen. Don't know if you know of him. Yes. Um, quite a prominent character. Lovely man. Lovely man. So he sits down in the other one. Um, and he happens to be a white gay man. Okay. Okay. Obviously, you don't know just by looking at him that he's gay. He didn't like have a man hanging out of his ass or anything <laughs> to like indicate I am gay. But he was dressed, as he is wont to do, fabulously. Okay? He is meticulous. Yeah, Tom's like, he's normally suited and booted, isn't he? Exactly. So he looked stunning, yeah. as he always does. The rest of us are, like, dripping with sweat. We've just come off an eight-hour, 12-hour flight, whatever it is. You know, and he's just there, pristinely clean. So I'm sitting there doing my check-in. And at one point in the middle, and he sits down. And then shortly after that, she goes, oh, excuse me. I, uh, I just, you know, if you'll excuse me, I just need to. And she stands up and she goes over and does and, and puts some of my paperwork on the back. And I think nothing of it. How many times have we checked in at a hotel and they go off and they get some paperwork or they get a printer, a printout from the printer and, you know, they're doing the stuff. And I'm sitting there and I'm yeah. not, I'm jet lagged and, you know, and there's other comics and milling about waiting to check in. And I think nothing of it until I realize, hang on a second, she hasn't gone to do something to do with my check-in. <laughs> She's literally stood up from checking me in, in the middle of my check-in. And has moved to sit in front of Tom and has sat down and is checking him in. And I'm going, what the hell just happened? And essentially what happened is, was that she was serving a Filipino woman when she realized that a white man was waiting. And she went, cannot make a white man wait. There was a hierarchy. Oh my and God. she stood up and she went and she checked him in entirely, gave him probably my friggin' room. And then once he was finished, she stood up from him, came back to me, sat down and finished. And I was sitting there going, you know, he's gay, right? You know, he's illegal in this country. What the hell was that? <laughs> what the hell was that? He's illegal in this country. Just shouting that over at the desk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Search his upper right pocket. It's got a, a watch and chewing gum in it. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's insane. Ooh, yeah. But you don't, so it's little things like that, that you don't, again, I don't think about how I look until that happens and you go, what was that? So it, was, it, could, it could have been that he was a man and I was a woman. Definitely probably was that I was Filipino and he was white. But even if it's because he was a man and you were a woman, it's still insane. It's just like in this, yeah, that just, just doesn't make sense does it, it? it's not something that we can fathom over here in our no. culture yeah exactly but it's definitely a part of other people's cultures and it's certainly you know um when people talk to me about travel and go do you love to travel of course who doesn't love to travel of course i love to travel but there are there certain places where they go "Ooh, wouldn't you love to go to turkey and i'm like actually not unless i can afford a very safe trip because i'm very well aware yeah. that that as a woman of color i'm not afforded the same protection or security that a, maybe a white blonde woman would receive mm. everywhere in the world. And that's the truth of it. And I learned that from my mother. I learned that traveling with my mother who traveled, loved traveling and said, yeah, I'm not going there again, or I'm not going there again. And she is full Filipino and she's um, tiny. She's a tiny, dark Filipino. I don't know how else to describe her, uh, you know, but she, she looks very much like she doesn't speak English. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, that's how she looked. Yeah, yeah. And she, yeah. She's actually yeah. a very highly educated physicist and computer programmer, but she wow. doesn't look that way. And so, she, so unless she opens her mouth or says something or they go, oh, I'm, you know, to, to constantly go, I am Western, I am Western. Yeah. She was subjected to a lot of ill treatment. And even if she does open her mouth, there's still that kind of overriding thing, you know, that you would get, especially when she was traveling around decades before I've been traveling around. Mm, yeah. Of, of second hands of second level citizenship. Yeah. So that was a real shocker for me. And you know, and also told me right. I know that I I know you can tell that I'm western when I walk around Asia. I'm taller for one thing because I'm half white, I'm paler, you know. Yeah. I've got body fat distribution that screams 
Western uh, <laughs> diet. And, and I, and, but I know, but it, if you, if you go to Singapore, I was looking at all of them going, give me five years in Singapore, maybe I can achieve what all these women have got, which is just beautiful. But it, it, when it's hot, you don't eat as much. You don't need to eat as much. You get energy from the sun. Yeah. You're drinking a lot of liquids. And, and they all have, every woman from 12 to 90 just has these beautiful thin little legs that come out of these teeny tiny shorts and these little flip flops. And I'm there going, well, I'm not showing the backs of my thighs to any of these people, you know, <laughs> just because <laughs> I like a bit of cheese and crackers, you know, and, um, and, the, you know, so you know that I'm Western, generally speaking, but every so often you get a little, eh, you're not, we don't see you as Western as everyone else. And at the same time, I'm there going, these people, you know, these people screwed you up, you know, you know, you've heard of imperialism, right? Like you, they are not your friends. What are you doing? I'm here. I'm willing to muck in. All right. I'll, you know, I'll wipe my sink out after I brush my teeth. You don't, you know, I'm not going to leave that a mess for you, but no. Okay, fine. Serve the white guy first. I just could not imagine. I've never seen that. And I just could not imagine seeing and like anyone, for whatever reason, whatever the driver was, whether it's like, you know, sexual orientation, gender, whatever it might be, that somebody is first of all being, you know, looked after, served, whatever it might be in a shop, wherever. And then the person working just turns their attention because they feel that the person behind them is higher in some way. Like, I just, mm. like the, the, the only thing that I think, Maybe I've seen that is just purely about people that have got more money or something. I don't know. But we do, we see it all the time. You do see it all the time. You just don't necessarily re realize it. And you point pointed at money. Yeah. People that's, with money yeah. get treated differently all the mm -hmm. time. And actually, yeah. if you go into, I mean, we see it in scenes in movies where someone walks into a swanky hotel and the guy immediately looks down his nose at them like, yeah, you don't belong yeah. here. And then is simperingly yeah. nice to the asshole, you know, that comes up to the desk next. I guess it's it doesn't happen so much here where it's kind of midway through a transaction mm. and they would literally no. stop and do something else. It's normally, as you say, like they'll be choosy who they serve. I guess the thing you see most commonly, well, it is going to start happening again now, is how often he's stood at a bar oh, and yeah. the barman's like, yeah, I don't like the look of you. I'm going to serve them mm. instead, even though you're obviously then that's, you know, picking Quite and choosing right. Quite who right. you're going to serve next based on. I love that. You look unvaccinated. I'm not serving <laughs> you. Yeah. yeah, I'm not coming near you. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, to do it like whilst you're halfway through yeah. checking you in yeah. and be like, no, I'm I off couldn't now. believe it either. It took me a while to clock. I don't think I clocked it straight away. Mm. It was only afterwards what that was I was going on. Yeah. Because I, I went and asked Tom, I said, did you just, what happened? He said, oh, I just checked in. You know, like I had to get all, put, like put all yeah, of the yeah. pieces of the puzzle <laughs> together and go, all oh, right. Because I was midway through check in when she stopped and. Yeah. Yeah, like you said, yeah. you just assumed yeah. she was off to do something, wouldn't you? Just and then come back. Yeah. So did she actually just outright tell you that's why that she, so she went and served? Tom oh no, 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 no. Of course oh, not. You no, and then she came and finished. Yeah, it, I, like I said, I figured it out after the whole thing. Yeah. Because yeah, like Rhea's not worth apologising to. You don't get you don't get told that's what happened. Oh, but I left a TripAdvisor review that <laughs> she will regret. Oh, I bet. <laughs> no, um, I know what, what, what put it together for me is when I spoke to Tom afterwards. I was like, Tom, had you already been at the desk? Did you ever, you know, those things. You go, well, maybe he was technically before me. You know how we British love a queue. I mm, will respect the queue. Yeah. But he was no, he came up after me and got finished before me. That just, yeah, I just couldn't, like, like I think it's like Sam said, it's, when it's in the middle of a transaction, I definitely have never, ever seen that before. Joe would be shouting at her. Oi, where are you oh, going? Oh, could you imagine? I would never let that go. <laughs> We've not There's finished no here. Way. Come back. No, yeah, exactly. it was my first time in Singapore as well. So I hadn't yeah. really. You're jet lagged. You're tired. You want your room. Mm. There's 20 of you checking in. You just. Mm. It is what it is. I won't let it happen again. I'll tell you that much. But was she not? But could, but this the other thing is as well, though, like. <laughs> You must have already spoken to her at this point. So she would have recognized that you had grown up somewhere else. Yes, but that's what I was saying to you earlier, is that even though I'm Western, Western Asian woman does not trump white Western man. Yeah. There's no way in the top trumps, uh, you know, 
of <laughs> in the top me versus deck. Tom Allen. Yeah, me versus Tom Allen. I was not winning that That's game. Just, it, well, it's a really shit game, isn't it? Over here, I win it. On, I I win it on card one. You know, he's just like I'm a man. I'm a woman. I win. I'm white. I'm, I'm Asian. I win. <laughs> I'm gay. I'm autistic. I win. You know, it's like I I'll, I, win, I win every time over here, but over there, I'm yeah. losing every time. It's a great top trumps deck. Yeah. Or the worst. Like, yeah. it depends how you look at it. So you were saying earlier how you spent some time in um, in America. I spent time as a child. I was there in California when I was like primary, like nursery, primary school. Yeah. But I know that you were actually in the US when it was the 9-11 oh, attacks. You've been stalking me, Joe? <laughs> This is a long time, like to, to wait twenty years time. to like go. Yeah. It's been twenty years. Come on, my podcast. But this sounds insane. Yeah. So my grandmother had a stroke um, in August of two thousand and one, and so my mother and I flew out to you know she had a quite a severe stroke, so she was hospitalized. She lived on her own up to that point. She lived in um, Minnesota. Okay. Near one of my mom's sisters. And so we went out and we stayed in my grandmother's flat and we stayed for a week uh, while, you know, and then we'd visit her in the hospital every day and just help her out, you know, anything, you know, we could do and figure out with my aunt what we were going to do at that point. We didn't know what her recovery would be or anything. And um, we went out on roughly uh, like the second or third. We must have gone on the third of September. Because the second is my sister's birthday, so there's no way that we miss that. So the third or the fourth, we flew out, and our return flights were on the 11th of September. So, and it, our return flights were at about 11 o'clock in the morning, maybe nine, ten okay. o'clock in the morning. Oh, were right, our flights yeah. like early flights to fly all the way back to Europe, which is where I'm pretty much born and raised. That's where I'm comfortable and familiar. And my mother, even though she's American, has lived in Europe since. Well, I was born there. So, you know, she's been in there since since the 80s and 90s, other than moving around a little bit. But she's always she married a German and very happily left the U.S. and and didn't have a problem with that. So we're in the car early, must be six, seven a.m. in a cab going to the airport. And the news is a bit disturbing. Obviously, because there's been an accident in New York. Yeah. So what's the local news? saying at that point uh, i was very young so you, you have to be um but at the beginning i at first it was an accident right the yeah. first the first plane everyone went this is an accident mm -hmm. then the second plane they go this is not an accident yeah. and they happened within what 15 minutes of each other i think and so we get to the we keep going we get to the airport then there's the other two planes as well you know the pentagon yeah and the one in, in Pennsylvania. And um and we get to the airport and of course it's mayhem because they shut American airspace, quite mm -hmm. rightly. They yeah. grounded every single plane because at that point they were going, we will ground everything, anything flying in the air, we will shoot it down. But that was very scary because a lot of people had planes in the air at that point. <laughs> a lot of people were like, yeah. can you can you can you just not, not not that plane not till it lands that's just but that's just my mom coming, you know, that's just you know, yeah. uni students going to university or whatever. So there was this whole period of time where they ground everything that wasn't that hadn't left wasn't leaving and everything that so flights that were going like New York to California were told to just land wherever. So they might land yeah. in like Kansas or wherever they were. Um, and so every flight had to be grounded. The the airport, of course, is mayhem because yeah. you've got everyone there with their luggage trying to go somewhere. Then you've got everybody who was on a plane getting off a plane because they've got their, you know, getting their suitcases, all of this, you know, just absolute mayhem. Nobody knows what's going on. Um, I had my ukulele with me and and so I was sitting there playing it. My mom is freaking out. My mom yeah. is absolutely freaking out. Uh, not in that way, not in the kind of like, oh my gosh, the world is ending, but in the, oh my God, we can't get stuck here. And she genuinely yeah. is going, this is how Handmaid's Tale started. And she's thinking, we're going to, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be, you know, corralled together and put in dresses and separated. And like, she genuinely thought it was, that's what her, was her fear because 
she's lived in the States and she's grown up in the States and she understands mm-hmm. their mentality. And yeah. she was like the territorial army, if they call up the TA, could just come in and rope. And and going back to her other stories, this is a woman who's lived through a lot of um, ups and downs when it comes to race relations in the United yeah. States. So yeah. she knows it's not a simple case of, well, you're a good person, you're a good person. And yeah. actually after that, for a good 10 years of travel, she was often pulled aside and randomly checked, even though she's Filipina and yeah. not anything to do with the Middle East. They don't know, they can't tell. They're not trained to to to, to distinguish between a, a dark Arab and a dark Asian. They just go, you're not white, come with me. So, and that, that was her experience after 9-11. But in the airport itself, I'm sitting there, you know, kid with my ukulele. The news comes up. And they're like, can we talk to you? Because I had the ukulele. I was like, yeah, sure. So somewhere out there, probably gone because, you know, Adobe no longer supports Flash Player. But there was a clip of me. (laughs) Oh, really? On the news? On the news of me crying in a Minnesotan airport, clutching a ukulele going, I just want to go home. Because my mom had freaked me out. But my mom was genuinely. And then so eventually it became clear on the day we weren't flying anywhere. Yeah. And then it became clear that we weren't going to fly anywhere for at least a few days. And this is where mm-hmm. my mom was like, okay, okay. And that's where we went back. At least we had somewhere to stay. We had my grandmother's house uh, flat to stay in because she was still in hospital and everything else. But we were there and my mom, that's when my mom started getting insane. She's just going, okay, okay, okay. You know what we could do? We could, we could rent a car and we can drive to the Canadian border. That's only a couple of hours from here. Yeah, 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 yeah. We're going to, fl- we're going to drive to Canada. We'll, we'll sneak oh, over the border gosh. and then, and then we'll, we'll drive to Toronto and then we'll get a flight from there. Like she was so freaked out about yeah. being stuck in the U S and just like, Oh my God, I'm never going to see your father again. Oh, oh my God. I'm just going. So that's how momentous it was to live in it. And we weren't even anywhere near the East coast. We were in the middle, you know, Minnesota's in the middle of the U.S. Um, but that is how crazy it was to be, you know, is 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 to to see it from the inside. Or, you know, it's close to the inside. I suppose that anyone from Britain could be, unless they were actually in New York. Yeah, at the time. Yeah, absolutely. It was just this kind of thing. Now they reopened airspace. I think about five, six days later, and then we were able to. God, a long time then. Yeah, well, is it like yes, in but, in terms of 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 that kind of industry? I mean, um, yes and no. Yes, even today, five days of no air. Like you, you know, even with the pandemic, look what's happened to air travel. Mm. But but I mm. don't think so. I don't think five or six days is that much at all. And and the airspace was like we were in Minnesota, so to go, okay, yes, you can fly from Minnesota to Europe. You know, they started allowing, I think, international flights. Like, you know, they opened it at different levels at different times. Okay. But I don't know. If you had that kind of <sighs> devastation occur all in one industry to only leave it for five days, just, you know, I mean, think that was huge. I mean, five, six days later, they were still putting out fires. They were still looking for bodies. They were still <laughs> digging through rubble. Oh, I'm not saying I want to fly at Those all. Those initial flights um, must have been terrifying. Not. Yeah, yeah. It was terrifying and in re- relief because obviously on the one hand people are going it could happen again, but on the other, I mean, the checks were severe to get on the flight. Mm. Trust me, they checked everybody. It was yeah. no there was no yeah. random selection. There was you want to fly, yeah. you will subject yourself to this. But the relief of actually sort of passing a certain point. And I couldn't tell you what that mm. point is. I can't tell you if it was, oh, once we were over the Atlantic or once the plane took off. I can't remember what that point was, but once we passed a certain point and we're definitely on our way home, it was like living, but it was, it was like living inside some kind of dystopian. It was real, Mm. but it was dystopian at the same time. You go, this is insane because it's a stressor. You put that kind of stressor onto a population, onto, Mm. and it's, and it's not similar, but not similar to what's happened with the pandemic because the pandemic is you know, is, uh, worldwide all encompassing. Whereas this happened yeah, yeah. to the United States. Yeah. And it's not, it's not people against people, is it? The pandemic, it's, it's something different, it, yes. isn't it? Well, so. I mean, I think I certainly as a scientist inhabit the, this is a nature versus in, in you know, this is a nature versus I- industry 
thing, yeah. the pandemic. Whereas you're right, mm. it was a human versus human thing. Yeah. With 9-11. God, I was thinking, like, you know, it's, um, I got to think as well, like what it must have been like in the airports to have like all the news on everywhere. Like to be in the airport and either just to have about to get ready to fly or you were one of those people that were, you know, flying and it ha- and had to have their um plane grounded like it must have been like you said not having necessarily announcements to tell you clear and concisely what you needed to know to what was going on but in actual fact just getting the media feeding you what's going on and that it always seems a lot scarier doesn't it in the media and because it they're giving you certain information it must have just been terrifying it must have been so surreal so scary like you know and then not necessarily on top of all of that not then getting answers as to what you're meant to do next where you're meant to go like especially if you're away from home and not in the position that you know you and your family were where you could actually just go back to a flat that you had access to yes like no I mean it, I mean there must have been people not as lucky as us stranded all over the place. Yeah. You're quite right. Yeah. Uh, it was, I think it's, for me, it's <sighs> surreal is a better word for me because I find that we watch every, we're so used to watching everything on the news and just disassociating from it. Even, I mean, yes. I'm quite sure you've, I mean, you feel disassociated from the Extinction Rebellion, for example, which, you know, keep pop cropping up in London and stopping things and blocking roads and, and all the rest of it, because you see it on the news, but you're not in it. I passed Absolutely, the Extinction yeah. Rebellion on one of their their um, marches, and one of their first marches that they did when they started their campaign a couple of weeks ago. They had three or four sets, at least three or four sets of drum bands that would kind of march through. And there's something very powerful about a drum band. There's something very powerful about the the beat and the fact that you know, and it's and it's echoing through the buildings and everything else. Yeah. And I found that very emotive. Um, and and then yeah. they decided to camp out in Covent Garden, right near where I live. Uh, so I went, okay, guys, all right, hang on, we need to talk about this because I'm 110 percent behind what you're trying to achieve. I get what you're doing. Don't totally agree with your methods, but you need to you need to move this off my lawn. Okay, you want to do it in Trafalgar Square? <laughs> all, all you want to do it in Whitehall? Go for it. That's fine. I will put up with all the helicopters that I hear every Saturday because of whatever protest is going on. But. Mm, Covenant, this is my backyard. Okay. And I became very nimby about it and was just like, mm, like, yes, but no, but <laughs> like, mm, <laughs> thank you. Like, also, and also, the Extinction Billion, they leave a mess behind. They don't tidy up <laughs> after themselves. And I'm going, you do see the irony of this, right? You yeah. see the irony yeah. oh my of what, yeah. what you've left behind for those of us that live here to deal with, to contend with. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's an idea, though. I realized it because I was reading an article about how two thirds of, of the public are not behind the Extinction Rebellion. Like they're like, no, they're just troublemakers and they, they have their dreadlocks and they don't wash and they're in their flowy hippie clothes. And I'm like, you're so right. Extinction Rebellion needs to dress in suits. They need to dress in suits and they need to look like they work in the city. That's going to get people's attention because then they won't be able to tell the difference between them and them. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So stop looking so different. Blend in. You want to go and attack the city? Do it in Armani. And then even Armani's going, hang on. <laughs> wait a minute. What? Wait, who whose side am I on here? Do you that's <laughs> yeah. That's what Extinction Rebellion needs to do. Well, it's then it's a case of um people looking like the vast majority kind of um trying to tell a message and, and spread a message. And then it's like there's cause then you, it's a lot more relatable, isn't it? When people are similar to you, it's like, oh, okay. Yeah. Right, I get it. Like people listen more yes. in them. But I think there's a, there is a detachment from it's like, oh, this is this group of people that I don't necessarily have anything. We're totally different. Yes. We've got clearly got different interests. So this is them and I'll do me. Exactly. Anyway, those are my ideas. <sighs> those are some of my travel stories. Yes, honestly, you've like you have had yourself in some situations. Yeah, but not my fault, right? Well, maybe the food poisoning. No, but gosh, yeah, no. I don't think we can blame you. Absolutely not. Yeah, how ironic that all of my stories are no, not all of them. Two of them were to do with my body, right? My face and my <laughs> stomach. Um, 
And that's those are the two things I remember: where I was <laughs> on nine eleven when I found out, um, and where I was when I found out Princess Diana died. Those are the two things that we all know, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow! I wow that brought that that brought the tone right down, didn't it? I didn't. Yeah, I did not mean to finish on that, but well, uh, what we normally finish. I've never been upgraded. I've never been upgraded, so I didn't have an upgrade story. Yeah, never been upgraded. Which we're kind of glad about, to be honest, because it means it's not just us that doesn't get upgraded. No. Uh, I've had it the other way around, though. You've been downgraded? <laughs> no, no, I've paid for an upgrade when I didn't have to. That was annoying. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they bought me a ticket for a show I was doing just up north in Leeds. Uh, and they bought me the ticket. And the first time I did it, the show, the ticket was a standard ticket. Because it was a tryout. I was auditioning for the show and it was a standard ticket. So I went up on standards. So the next time they bought me a ticket, I just went, oh, it's only like 10 quid to upgrade to first class. I'm going to treat myself to first class because I haven't bought the ticket. So I treated my, you know, I bought the upgrade. And then when I was looking for my, you know, my ticket, I, I realized that the upgrade and my original ticket had seats in the same carriage. And I was like, oh, they bought me a first class ticket. <laughs> oh, so I my. paid for an upgrade. When I already had a first class ticket, going, damn it! But you have been given an upgrade. It's just that you have also <laughs> paid for it. Yeah. So, well, I wasn't upgraded for free. They bought me. So when I did the show, then they bought me a first class ticket. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I didn't, I didn't notice that. <sighs> and then the next time I did the show, I forgot that they bought first class tickets, and I think I upgraded again. Oh, <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> I know, but I'm just. But it's just one of those automatic things where you just go, because now on British trains, on some of the networks, in order to do an upgrade, you have to bid for it. You can't just buy one. What? Well, you can really? for like way more than it's worth. Yeah, you have to you have to bid on an auction in an auction for it. It's ridiculous. I've never heard yeah. of this. And so I don't get trains very often though. So. It's new and I hate it. And I just think it's cheeky as anything. Yeah, that's really odd. But if the train is like more than so like just whoever's paying the most can have the seat. Yeah, exactly. They go, there's only this many. This, there's only this many upgrades available at this cheap price because the rest we've saved for proper people who pay for them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, then you, and then you get on the train having not paid for an upgrade and you look and you go, so where are all the proper people then? And they'll be like, well, actually, it's still COVID, so they're not traveling. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I would have paid you a little bit of money to go up there. But no. Okay, fine. Yeah. Well, I'm going to sit back here with all the other muggles. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness so, so Ria where you, have you got any travel any future travels planned either gigs abroad or holidays planned? no none of the above where would you like to go I would like to go somewhere with sun I think okay because I've really missed that I you know that first that first lockdown 2020 that summer very happy with that very happy with that staycation don't work. Go to the park. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> not a problem. Not a problem. And then this summer, so that winter, 2020 was a really cold winter. And I was like, that's fine. I'm going to put up with this because I'm going to have myself another hot girl summer. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then 2021 came and I'm like, where's the summer? And they're like, you don't get one. I'm like, why not? And they're like, oh, it's been rubbish. It's been awful. It's yeah. been awful. So I really feel like I haven't had the warming of my bones okay. that I need. And am I going right into winter again? Yeah, I'd love to go. Part of me wants to go and experience just like a five-star resort, you know, where your room is nice and the pool is nice mm -hmm. and the beaches are great. Part of me wants to go to Thailand and just experience just natural beauty and, yeah. and turquoise water. Um, so anywhere like that, I'd love to do that. The Seychelles, just anywhere I've never been. I think I'd love to visit an island and eat fish for yeah. a week. Oh, nice. Sounds lovely. In a mango, you know. So <laughs> that's the wish list. If anyone listening wants to upgrade me from Alicante, I'm open. I'm open to it. <laughs> we are pointing them in your direction. Please do. Please Indeed. do. So that would be, that's yeah. the, that's, that would be nice. But I also have pets. I have cats. I have guinea pigs. So also traveling with the family is tricky because then we have to find cat sitters and pig sitters. Mm. Not, I mean, or well, a cat and pig sitter. One person who can handle our menagerie 
Well, uh, thank you so much for coming on and telling us your stories. Pleasure. They are definitely different to the stories we've had on previous yes. A lot of the stories we've had, Ooh. people have put themselves in situations. That's it, yeah. You just, you know, you're just trying to go about your day, just trying to get involved. I know. And things just happen it to happen you. Happen to me because of my face. I know, right? <laughs> just, you know, oh, your face should be able to handle this stew. No, it can't. Okay, no, it can't. <laughs> Your face should be able to handle it. <laughs> Asian face. Oh my! Western God. stomach. So some um, pretty wild stories from Ria. One of which, nine eleven. So we have um, not long gone past the anniversary, um, and there's always lots of. Um, documentaries and such on um, all the streaming sites and TV and I've watched loads of these yeah. and you kind of get the same sort of message like each time still interesting though but have you ever spoken to somebody that's been amongst the the event and the energy of when that was going on and and maybe indirectly part of the collateral and stuff like that talking to Ria that was yeah that that's the closest person I've ever spoke to who was yeah. kind of there during the event. Yeah. I feel like it really makes it um, feel like, I know it's obviously real. I know it really happened, but it's not just this thing that you see on telly that happened to other people. It was kind of. Yeah, absolutely. You're like, oh, I've spoken to someone who's actually there. hundred percent. So when I was in New Jersey, yes. I met a um, a fireman that was there helping out when nine eleven when the nine eleven strikes hit. Oh, right in the middle of it. Yeah, so I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know what the fire department sort of like roles and stuff are, but I think he was some kind of like. Yeah, they have like chief, like chiefs and stuff, don't they? Fire chief. Yeah. Yes, chief. That's 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 the one. So he 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 did that, and he was like managing part of the like the effort and the cleanup and everything like that um, in New York at the time. So I got like some, some stuff from him, but that was, that was a perspective of somebody that was working and trying to help the situation and ha- ease the situation, help the people involved. And obviously Rhea's side of the event is being, you know, just somebody that hasn't got a clue what's going on. Just, um, it must've been like super scary. Like both, both sides of it must've been, really really scary it's just remarkable talking to people who were like in that situation even though she was like you a lot younger than me i assume because Mm. she says she was very young at the time and i was 18 so i remember vividly i was at work 9 11 happening yeah so it's 2001 so i was actually only like uh, eight years old so i really didn't i guess I, I had I didn't really know what was going on. Like I remember seeing the news. I remember seeing like the the only memory I have is seeing the the news and people like scrambling like up these um like rocks and stuff to like get away get as far away from where it was all happening as possible. And my mum's like we were in the living room. and My mum was stood there like watching the news report too. But I just. It's, yeah, I, I think I was too young to really understand what was going on, to be honest. Yeah. But, but yeah, it was um, super interesting to hear Rhea's, Rhea's story and uh, what it was like for her to go through that. And then obviously we've got some some of her other um, stories as well, like food poisoning. We've had that a couple of times on this podcast, podcast now. And again, I just honestly, hats off to anybody getting a flight with food poisoning. I've had, I've had food poisoning just being at home and my god i'm a drama queen when that happens let alone having to do it on a plane oh my god i know and it sounded bad didn't it yeah a long flight as well yeah so yes good episode a bit more of a serious episode but some super interesting stuff back to the lols next week yeah same time next week Find us on Instagram, misadventures in travel, follow us, like our posts, support us. And if you've got any stories, any misadventures of your own, DM us, let us know, and we could share them on the podcast.